Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. You're live. Fantastic. Um, so, welcome to my talk on uh, Blender 3D, which is a 3D modeling software uh, suite which enables uh, people to uh, 3D model, 3D animate, create video games, create uh, videos, uh, do image compositing. Uh, it's a media creation suite, and it's very powerful. And today we're going to talk about a subset of what it can do, uh, just because talking about everything Blender can do would be overwhelming for you and me, and uh, eventually just a waste of our time. So basically, the question we're going to answer today is, Blender, what is it? How do I use it? And what do all of these buttons do? Uh, there's a lot of buttons. There's a lot of them. Um, but first, you should probably know that you can trust me, so I'm going to answer, who am I? My name is Elijah Voigt. Um, I am referred to as Pop uh, Backtick on irc.freenode.net. Um, you may see me as Pop and Fresh. Uh, there's a series of names that I have. Um, Pop and something after that is usually what I stick with. Uh, I am a developer, student developer at Oregon State University. Um, I'm also a student there. Uh, and I just recently became the president of the Oregon State University Linux user, Users Group. So I'm very enthusiastic about open source software in general. Uh, and I've been using Blender for seven years, thereabouts. Um, so although I haven't really contributed to the code base necessarily, I have created a myriad of projects. Uh, these are a few. Um, I got into doors for a while, so I made some door-related projects. Um, this is just a little hack I did a few weeks ago. And, um, and um, this is a, I replicated another artist's painting in Blender 3D. Um, and this was the result. Uh, so yeah, these are just a few things I made. Uh, I've also done animations for my robotics team at high school. That was really fun. So like I said, what we're going to be covering is a small subset of what Blender can do. Uh, that includes polygonal modeling materials, which includes shaders and the difference between the render engines in Blender, which are cycles, and the Blender render engine. We're also going to cover nodes, which is a really interesting concept, and it allows you to do a lot of powerful things. Compositing, uh, which is basically modifying an image to um, be uh, modifying an image without um, having to put too much processor power into changing it. And then also modifiers, which are um, something that are used for modeling in 3D and Blender 3D. Um, what won't be covered is animation, the game engine, Python scripting in Blender, textures, sculpting, the physics engine. If any of these things interest you, I encourage you to look into them. There are documentation. There is documentation for Blender, um, and all these features are very powerful on their own, uh, in their own respect. But um, I don't have time to cover them, and uh, in some ways, I'm not an enough of an expert really to talk about them uh, at length. Um, also, we won't cover all of the hotkeys. Hotkeys are a very big part of Blender. There are so many of them. Uh, and that's just one thing that you just have to use Blender to get used to. Um, and there's also a lot of other features, like you can use Blender for audio editing. And, and there's a myriad of other things. I couldn't list all the features off if I wanted to. It's a very large production suite. Um, and then after I do these slides, we're going to go into the demo. This talk is meant to mostly be a demo, um, but I have to contextualize what a, a lot of what I'm doing beforehand. So that's what these slides are for. And uh, that's a little reminder for me. So let's get started. Uh, modeling. Uh, when you turn on Blender, this is pretty much what the interface is going to look like. You're going to have uh, down here is a timeline, which is used for animation. You scrub through it to see uh, your 3D environment change, um, depending on what you've told it to do over time. Uh, this is, like I said, is the 3D modeling environment. We have a grid here, which is used to uh, contextualize, uh, like give you bearings, like where things are in, relative to each other in space. This is a camera. Uh, basically, that's the point of view uh, that all the rendering will take place from. This is a light source. Um, it's where the light is emitted from uh, when doing the simulation and doing the uh, final rendering. And then this is a 3D object. Um, 3D objects are objects. Uh, I really don't know how to explain it much more than that. Uh, it will make more sense if it doesn't uh, soon. And these little arrows uh, indicate the axes. We have the uh, x-axis, which is red, the y-axis, which is green and the z-axis, which is uh, blue. And if you click on one of these arrows, it will move the object in those in uh, that direction. And this is the utility bar, um, which basically, if anything happens in the 3D space, you can influence it and change it uh, settings-wise with the utility bar. So that's where render settings would be, uh, physics settings, uh, material settings, et cetera. Um, so let's move on. Um, like I said, we're going to. Uh, talk about what objects are first, uh, just as like a narrative and like a workflow. This is an object. Uh, it's a cube. 
Um, but this is something called wireframe mode, where, um, sorry, I'm going to take a step back. Who here has done any sort of modeling, 3D modeling of any sort? One person? Two people? Three? Uh, who here has used Blender specifically? One person? Awesome. Thank you. I've gone into it, but I just sort of got into That's fine. You're, you're, you're ahead of the game. Um, so this is wireframe mode. Uh, essentially, objects have uh, faces. Uh, we'll get into that later. Uh, and those cover up uh, this like skeletal structure uh, that you're looking at right now. Um, and uh, every object is made out of three things. One is, uh, the first thing is a vertex. Uh, and like the mathematical vertex, um, it has, or like the mathematical like point in space on a graph, it has no volume. So if you try to render uh, a vertex, it will not show up. It, has, it takes up no space. Um, and then there's the edge, which also has no space. But that's what um, happens when you connect two vertexes together. Uh, they make an edge. And when you hook up more than one edge together, a minimum of three, you get a face. Um, and then if you hook up multiple faces, you get complex geometry, like uh, a cube, or this is a monkey, if you can see that. Um, just a little cute uh, character that Blender comes with. Um, and uh, also, if I'm going too fast, stop me, ask questions. I apologize. I've been doing this for a very long time, and I try to tone it down. But a lot of this is very much second nature for me. So if you don't know what's going on, just ask. Um, so you said more than three is? Sorry, three, three, three is a minimum for making a face. It's like a triangle. So then a 3D would be four? Or so a face is two-dimensional, right. uh, inherently. Uh, an object is three-dimensional. So you, um, you have a vertex, which is one-dimensional. Uh, uh, vertex, which is one-dimensional, edge, which is two-dimensional, hook up those, you get a uh, three-dimensional fa uh, face, which is two-dimensional in three dimensions, and then you can make a three-dimensional object with multiple faces. Okay. Sorry, I was trying not to <gasps> bug it down with math, but... So the, so the three dimensions would be more than one face to get three? Uh, yes. So... Um, so you need six faces, or... or like a cube, you'd have six. There are six faces in a cube, yes. Um, but there could be, if it was like a pyramid, it would be four faces. Sure, um, yeah, I didn't. I wasn't trying to set a limit on the number of faces for a 3D object. Oh. Um, I was saying edges for a single face. There are three edges for a single face minimum, which is just a triangle. You can't have a two edge face. OK, what Sorry. Is, is there a minimum to get a 3D? How many faces for a 3D? Four two, faces? technically. I mean, it depends on how. Like, uh, you want it to look like a solid object. You can do a small At least four. Yeah, but if you if you don't mind it, it just kind of looks like a kite or something, but still. Uh, so like, three, like, two, like this, two planes like this. Would so like I have a I have a plane right here. Um, this is a two dimensional plane, and um, sorry, I'll make uh, more. I'll, this will make more sense in a second. But what I just did was. Oh, okay. so, that's so that's 3D. That's a 3D object. Like this has to exist in 3D space to exist. Okay. Um, so at least two faces, more than one face. Just... Sure. Yeah. Well, it um, could be one face if if you. So okay. we'll cover that after the slides. Uh, the demo will uh, answer a lot of these questions for you. So, so a face is just a 2D polygon in 3D space. Yes. Okay. Correct. Mm. Cool. Okay. Um, so once you have your object, what you're going to want to do is use manipulators. Um, and down here, there are these buttons that are always in the 3D view. Uh, that allow you to move, which are the arrows, resize, which are the squares, and rotate, which are the circles. So you have your monkey, um, but you want to like stretch it on the z-axis, and you want to move it on the x-axis, and you want to um, rotate it on the y-axis, or any combination of those. You would use these manipulator tools, uh, handles. Um, you'd use these... Uh, manipulators to resize uh, the object in space. Um, and then you would move it around like this, uh, if that makes more sense. Um, cool. So once you have an object, yeah, what's up? Can you move the, um, uh, can you move the center point? Or like yeah, you can. Yeah. Um, do you want me to do that now? No, no. Uh, but yeah, you can move the center point to be anywhere. Um, so really, that's just the point at which all those manipulations happen. And right. you can have that be 10 feet away right. if you is want it, to. Is it like modal where it's like, it's like it has an off center, it has a, 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 a axis center, it has, is it like modal or is it like Maya? Uh, in my experience, it's more like Maya. I also haven't used modal though, so I really can't speak to that. Um, yeah. So uh, let's go back. 
Um, so uh, once you have your object in the position and rotation and size that you want, you have modifiers. Uh, and modifiers are basically rules that you set on your geometry to manipulate it. Um, so for instance, this is the smooth modifier or the subdivision surface modifier, which sets a rule that says um, every single face, there are faces, uh, split that into four faces and then smooth out the geometry, which basically turns um, a really good example actually is a cube. So uh, you have a cube, right? Uh, and now we're gonna, gonna whoop, we're gonna add the modifier subdivision surface. And if you subdivide a cube enough, it will just become a sphere. Oh, sorry. Um, so basically, that just means that you have taken every face and like cut it into four, smoothed it out, cut it into four, smoothed it out, and then it will. Be, if a cube gets smooth enough, it will just become a sphere. Can you see that? Can everyone see that? Uh, and I can go through the steps. Is that the stack? The stack? Or like the, all of the modifiers that you add, is that? Yeah, so you can have a stack of, of modifiers. So uh, they will have uh, varying influence. They, uh, Blender will apply one modifier, and then the next modifier, and then the next modifier. So it's can like, change after the fact? Yeah, you can just move them around arbitrarily. Um, for instance, I can have an array modifier, uh, and I can choose when that happens. It doesn't really matter for here, but an array modifier is really cool, because you can just set up and have like a series of objects in a row, and you can offset them in various ways. Um, not super important, uh, but yeah, it's really fun, really cool. If you have like a, I don't know, some random scene where there's like an army of characters, and you want to just have the same person and model them, and not have to model a million different people. Um, so that's what a modifier is. You basically take your geometry, set rules, and the geometry will conform to those rules, so you don't have to hand modify it every single time. Uh, and then once you have your scene set up, you can start rendering. And rendering is basically taking the, the scene that you have, and it says, where's all the light coming from? OK, uh, simulate that light hitting all the objects. Now take the light that's hit all those objects, and now uh, bounce it off the objects into the camera. And it's like how light works in the real world. Um, it's basically simulating what would happen if you uh, turned this scene into a uh, real world scene, like you put real world physics, uh, real world, well, real world light into the, into the scene, and then see, say like, what does that look like? Um, it's kind of abstract for me to say right now. It's a sort of second nature, like I said, um, but I will try to elaborate on that um, if you all have questions. And then, but that's kind of boring. Uh, every object starts off gray, uh, and nothing gets the color gray if that's your favorite color, or whatever. But uh, usually, people want it to be a little more vibrant, so. For instance, you would add something uh, called materials, which are uh, essentially a skin that you paste onto the object. Um, so in this instance, I just said it. I, I just said, okay, object. I want you to have a diffuse texture, uh, diffuse uh, texture. Uh, sorry, material. Um, and I want that skin that you put on to just be the color pink. And that's it. That's the only rule in giving the geometry. Um, so then, when you render it, it would look pink. And this is sort of a dim scene, so it looks more purple. But that is. Uh, this color here is being pasted onto every face, and that's what's resulting in your image. Um, and then once you have that set up, uh, you maybe want a slightly more complicated material. So you would you would introduce this concept of nodes, and nodes are basically boxes with inputs and outputs. Uh, and in this instance, the output node is the monkey's material, and the input node here, this input node that hooks up into the output node, is just diffuse texture. So it's very similar to what I did here, except instead of pink. Uh, I should have done a better scene, but it's just white. So we're just saying uh, white diffuse texture pumps straight into the material of the uh, monkey. So you're basically saying, I want the skin of the monkey just to be diffuse texture. Um, but then you say, like, well, that's too diffuse. I want it to be shinier. So you take the glossy node, and that outputs uh, the glossy skin, uh, and you hook that right into the um, uh, monkey skin. You say, well, OK, well, that's fine, but that's too metallic. So I want to mix the two results that I just had. I want to mix this. With this, so you would say something like, uh, "We have the mix node, and you can pl plug the diffuse texture into the mix node, and the glossy texture into the mix node, and output that to the monkey." Now it has more of like a porcelain feel to it. Um, are there any questions? This is a very powerful tool. Nodes are sort of my my jam. I like nodes a lot. Um, so, are there any questions on this? This will make more sense in the demo. I will do a lot of this. Um, it's very powerful. What's up? Can you like say about different configurations and like apply different ones at a time? Uh, so you have 
I, you have an arrangement of nodes, like you create a sure. specific texture. Yeah. But you might have two. You can, one character that you kind of switch between. Yeah, totally. You can just change the material. I mean, it's it's it, it's an art product in the end. So you can manipulate it frame by frame. You can change the texture frame by frame so if you, you want it. Well, yeah, to... yeah. Oh, yeah. Blender has this really cool feature where everything is animatable. So every single value, every single object, you can animate it. So uh, if you have a like this mix node has something called um, uh, I forget what the exact verbiage is, but it's essentially influence. So how much influence does the second ob second texture have? over the first texture when mixing them together. And you can animate that. So it can look like this, the monkey is going from glossy to diffuse to glossy to diffuse. Um, and this is very powerful. If you, if, you have it, if you didn't have that feature and you got it, it would blow your mind. Trust me. Um, that's not a very good selling point. But um, essentially, uh, it's a really cool feature. Um, Nodes are really cool. Uh, you can also do something called um, node groups, where you basically set up a, a string of these together and say, I want that to be one node. So you basically take a bunch of boxes with inputs and outputs and create your own custom box with inputs and outputs. Uh, and that's really powerful, because then you can carry that box from file to file to file. Uh, and it simplifies it for the artist. Like a template. Like a template, exactly. Um, yes, very good. And then nodes are also used in rendering. Uh, what we did here was we rendered the monkey. We set up a nice scene with the monkey looking very stoic. But we rendered this checkerboard background. I don't know if you can see that. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, checkerboard background means that it's essentially transparent. So the monkey is not transparent, but the background is transparent. So we could put something behind the monkey, and it would show up behind it without having to like cut it out. Does that make sense? OK, cool. I'm, good. I'm seeing a lot of uh, heads nodding. So what we do is we take that, and we put that into its own separate node environment. Uh, there are material nodes, there are output nodes, there are um, uh, compositing nodes. Um, do you have a question? Yeah, I'm trying to kind of understand what exactly a node is. Is it just a, a single pixel sort of thing? Or is it no, no, see this block? See this block right here? Yeah. That's a node. Um, and essentially it's it's like a, like a mathematical function, if that makes sense. You have inputs and outputs, oh. but abstracted sort of into a, into a broader context of um, art, if that makes sense. So like okay. with this, you have... Um, so this, it affects each pixel in the image. It's like a, it affects different things. In this instance, uh, the effect that, it's, that this material node is, is having, this node, is affecting the material that's put onto the monkey. Um, and the, the material is like a skin that you put on the monkey. So you're essentially giving rules to what the skin of the monkey looks like. Oh, okay. And then with this, uh, it's sort of closer to what you were imagining, where the output node here is um, the final image that we get. So this final image uh, is given a bunch of rules. So you say, we'll just jump ahead. Um, the final node is given a bunch of rules, and those rules will dictate what it prints out as the final image, sort of. Um, so in here, what we have is we have um, this is an alpha over node, and you say uh, I'm going to give you two rule. I'm going to give you two things, and uh, it could be two images. It could be in this instance, it's an image and a color. This is a the color green. Uh, that little button right there is the color green. I made it the color green. Um, and you have the monkey image, and you say, I want you to take the color green and put it behind the monkey. And that's where like, you plug them in. Uh, and then you plug that to the final output node. Uh, and basically, that says, um, OK, the final image should be, um, the, final image should be uh, the combination of the color green and the monkey. Um, so it's like a mathematical function in that there are inputs and outputs. Okay. And the inputs and outputs uh, mean different things in different contexts. So nodes can basically simplify adding effects or scrolling getting. Yeah, basically. Like yeah, and in Blender, they're kind of the only way to do it. Um, so like if you compare that with Adobe like, or some other, how would you compare that? Like just regular? Features. So like in Adobe, what you might do is you would have like a, a video, and you would say, I want this video to have like a high bloom effect, right? Have you ever used like that yeah, feature? Yeah, yeah. OK, well, so with video editing, you would say, I want this to have a high bloom effect, which basically just gives it that like really like bright washed out effect. Um, and that's sort of like a node. And in, that, in the Blender instance, you would just have a bloom effect node, and you plug that to the final output. Oh. Uh, so if that makes sense. Um, so today, now we're going to do a demo. What we want is to create this image, kind of. Uh, I don't know where that font is anymore, so it's going to look crappier. Um, but that translates to, this is not a popsicle. Uh, very refer referential to the, this is not a pipe 
uh, painting, if you know that one. Um, and I will try to bring these up afterwards, but there are three great resources for learning Blender if you are interested. Those include CG Cookie, you can write these down, uh, Blender Artist Forum, and Blender Guru. CG Cookie has some really good beginner tutorials. Um, they have a series of 10 videos that basically teach you how to get started with Blender. The Blender Artist Forum is really good for um, basically like any questions you have. You're like, I tried to do this thing, uh, I was following this tutorial, and it didn't work. Can you please help me find an answer? And try to just you know use your online uh, diplomacy when you're on that website, uh, just because you know complaining is not going to help anybody. And then Blender Guru is for more of the advanced uh, uh, learning, where you say, I know how to use Blender. Uh, I want to do some really cool thing, like create a beautiful snow scene of a cabin or something like that. And he'll go from the ground up and build you, or tell you how to build a snow scene of the cabin and show you some really cool hidden Blender features. Uh, hence the Guru title. Um, so, like I said, oh, sorry. Has anyone, have everyone written that down that wants to? You can also take a picture, or I have these slides available online. I'll try to hook them up with uh, Siegel later. Cool. Um, so now we're going to do the demo. Uh, file new. OK. And I'm going to turn it now. What version is uh, Blender? I think they're on 2.71. This, this says 2.72 up here, but I'm on the most recent version, just because that's what my operating system gives me. Um, so Blender looks like this. Uh, what you're going to see when you first open it up is a splash screen. And they do some really cool thing where they take a, a community piece of art and they ask them if they can use it as their splash screen piece. And so that's made by some dude in the community that just uses Blender for his art. Um, so uh, this is what you're going to see, something very similar. Uh, and uh, like I said, this is the utility note. This is the utility panel. This is the timeline panel. Uh, and this is, uh, I don't really know how to describe this panel, but essentially uh, it's like a sub panel for the 3D view. There are two sub panels for the 3D view. Um, and those just give you a lot, those just give you more buttons, honestly. Um, and if you don't know what the buttons are, it, it's very hard to get started. And hopefully that's what today will teach you how to fix it. Okay, cool, kind of. Um, can you get rid of most, sorry, I don't want to Yeah, sure. Oh, can you get rid of most of the stuff that you don't need, like if yeah. you don't need timeline, if you don't need it? Yeah, totally. Um, so what, what we're going to do right now is we're going to right click this. Every time you see one of these, like arrows, the, the up down arrow, if you can see that, sorry, uh, the up down arrow right there, you right click. Right. Do you right click? Yeah, and then you say join area, and you just say get rid of that. Uh, and then right click join area up. Um, and now we really only need these two panels. But this is a 3D view panel, and this is a utility panel. And you can save that state. Yeah, you can save the state, totally. Um, there are like different states that come with Blender, and you can make your own oh, cool. using the plus button right there. And you can even have se separate scenes, which just good separation of concerns. So what, I'm, what you can see here, uh, right here, is what I'm pressing. Uh, if I don't say what I'm pressing, just look at that. Uh, if that doesn't help either, just ask. So first, uh, I'm going to. Uh, you select objects with the right mouse click. So I'm going to right mouse click and get rid of the camera and the, the lamp, because right now we don't need them. Um, and now middle mouse click uh, does this like navigating, like rotating around an object. So that's how you change your view. Um, and then if you want to go into edit mode, and edit mode is where you get to edit the vertexes, the faces, the edges, uh, you press tab. And then uh, I'm going to click on these little manipulators. Um, I'm going to increase the size of the object on the y-axis. Not important what axis, but it's just good to know. And I'm going to decrease the size of it on the z-axis, which is the blue one. Uh, so now that is sort of looking, uh, looking pretty good. And you can actually change the size of it, um, like general like size, rotation, and such, uh, without going into edit mode. But what we're going to do uh, now is we're going to uh, do something really cool. It's called edge loops. Um, and now I, I describe edges as being these, uh, like you have a vertex, you have multiple vertice vertices, those make uh, an edge. Multiple uh, edges being brought together make an edge loop. So this is a loop of edges. Uh, and that's really powerful because you can select an edge loop and move that, um, which sounds like, why would you bother? That doesn't even make sense. But you can create edge loops, and it gives you a lot more geometry to manipulate. So we're going to hit Control-R, and then we're going to press 2, and that's going to give you two sets of edge loops to work with. Uh, and an object is just a piece of basic geometry that you make more and more complex. It's like a piece of clay that you slowly whittle down and refine to be more precise. 
uh, and look more like what you want. So that's what we're doing is we're adding geometry so that we can manipulate the object. Because right now, like this face, we can't make this face any more complex than it already is. Like we can't change this. We can only move it, make it, you know, make it a different size. Uh, yes, that's uh, something I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, uh, and also, we're going to use um, a modifier really quick. We're going to cut this object in half, actually. So what we're oh, what we're going to do actually is we're going to. I just made an edge loop right here. Uh, so basically, we we separated the top and the bottom um, with an edge loop, and now we're going to select all of the faces. And if you're intimidated by like me working fast, don't worry, that's fine. Um, it's it's took me seven years to get to this point, so uh, don't be intimidated, please. Um, and then I'm going to press X to delete. X is just the delete button. So if you have uh, faces selected, you press X to delete. You can choose uh, vertices, edges, or faces, and those will have different effects. Um, I'm going to delete the faces, and then we're going to go into the modifier panel, and we're going to select. Help me find mirror. Uh, right there in the middle. Mirror. There we go. And we're going to mirror on the z-axis. Um, and this means that basically if I select this face, for instance, and move it up, it's mirrored on the other axis. So I'm going to press Control-Z to undo. Um, and this is going to be really useful because um, a popsicle, which is what we're making, uh, is mirrored on the z-axis in this instance. Imagine like that's the front of the popsicle. Um, so that's cool and very useful. Um, so. Um, now we're going to do this really cool thing where we're going to, if we go back to the original, uh, there's like these sort of, it sort of looks beveled, if that makes sense, like it's sort of inset right here. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to press E, uh, and E, uh, I literally don't have words to describe this, so I just have to do this, try to just go along. E takes a face uh, and then pulls another face out of it, uh, but keeps it connected to the geometry. Um, that doesn't make sense. It's OK. So you press E, and it'll, it'll give you this line. And it's telling you what axis you are pulling the new face out of. And that's what's going on. Um, so uh, let's go to face select. E, 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 E. You see what's going on here? Does this make sense? Yeah. For me, it's just intuitive. So I really can't explain it any other way. Oh, it, just it, just extrudes. Extrudes. it extrudes the faces out, um, if that makes more sense to you. Great. Um, yeah, so it's click the face, press E, and drag. Um, and then you can resize it, and E again, and pull. And I get really excited when I do this enough. Uh, and then we don't want that, though. Um, e is a really powerful tool when you use it like really um, minutely, I guess. So just like, a, like in little bits. So we're going to select this one face and press E. And then we're going to bring it in size-wise on that axis and size-wise on that axis. And then we're going to just like bring it down, OK? And then we're going to select this face here and do the same thing. Press E. And if you press Shift and do anything, like press this and then Shift, uh, sorry, Shift and then this, it will, uh, well, it's supposed to, whatever. Um, it's supposed to like allow smaller control, yeah, finer control. So I, I'm, I'm resizing it, but now I have more control. This is without Shift. This is with Shift. You have to hold Shift down. Hold Shift down, yeah. Uh, so I'm resizing. Moving it like that, and click this, resizing. Whoa, don't freak out. No. OK, and then we're just going to move that down. Whoa, come on. Move that down. OK. So uh, this geometry might not make sense right now. Don't worry, it will. Nope. E. I'm, I know what I'm doing. Okay. Is it a snapper? So what's happening is I'm getting too close to the like center point of manipulation. So like that center point, if you cross it, it freaks out. Just has a heart attack. Doesn't know what's going on. Um, so you have to kind of be gentle with it. Um, so that's cool. Uh, what do I want to do now? Uh, now we're going to smooth it out and just see what it looks like. Because right now it looks like it's from like 1996. Uh, and something I'm going to do to make this go a little faster is, is uh, I'm going to use box select, which basically selects multiple things. So everything inside of this box, every dot, I guess I should say, uh, will be selected. So what that did was it just selected the top. Um, it didn't select these, though, because the dot, like the center dot, was not selected. Uh, and then we're going to just move this down so we get everything a little thinner. 
Uh, also, I'm pressing Z to go into wireframe mode. Uh, that was a little confusing. Um, so that's cool. Now we're going to go into subdivision surface. And like I said, it just smooths it out. Um, so that kind of looks ugly. Uh, and we're going to do that little control R trick to add edge loops to uh, give it a little more refined look. How did, um, you, how did you round it? So I rounded it by just using the subsurface modifier right here. That's what's going on here. Um, so that just smooths it out. But like I said, it takes every face and splits it into four, right? So if there's um, so, so. if there's a higher concentration of geometry, it will actually look sharper. OK, so, 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 so uh, it makes items look more rounded. Yeah, more it smooth. does make items look more rounded. But you can influence how round it looks by adding more uh, a higher concentration of geometry in one area. So we're going to go into a different layer. These layers are really good, just separation of concerns. Like you would have your objects in one layer and your lighting and camera on another layer. Um, we're going to go into the second layer, uh, which is a button down here. Does that make sense? Can you see that? OK. Uh, and we're going to hit Shift S to move our cursor. And the cursor is important, because that's where it's going to spawn objects. Um, and we're going to press Shift A to spawn a cube. And remember that neat trick that we did a few minutes ago, where we made this into a uh, sphere. Um, this is a, a cube that we have just subdivided enough to look closer to a sphere. And we're going to go into edit mode, and you can see the outline of what the actual cube looks like. Because we haven't, this, this weird thing with, sub, with modifiers where it will modify your geometry, but it won't apply those changes. You can still modify the original geometry and go, oh, and go back. Um, but if you want to, you can apply this, not in edit mode though, apply it, and now the geometry is actually a sphere. Um, but we don't want that. Is there a. Uh... Do they give the mathematical formulas for how they? It's all open source. I should point that out, by the way. Blender is totally open source and free, and you can contribute if you want. That's why I'm here. Um, so if you want to look at the source code and ask about the algorithms, I'm sure it says it somewhere what the algorithms are. Um, yeah. um, so uh, we, we want a die, though. We want a dice. Uh, and not the sharp die, but like a rounded die, like one that's been well used. So we're going to add some edge loops. And that's going to concentrate geometry towards the corners. And a die will sort of start to appear. Uh, I haven't added the. I'm not going to add the faces, but if we wanted, we could move these edge loops by pressing Alt Shift and then right click, uh, and that will just select an entire edge loop. And we can just move the geometry so it's even closer. Is there a way to get that to make out of the way? No. Yeah. Sorry. So you can just click it, and it's gone. Um, I just like. I just noticed that when teaching people, it's nice to have it available. Uh, but yeah, it does get in the way when you're actually in, in a good workflow. Uh, so if I make this sharp enough, I can just make this look like a cube, but I don't want to. Um, does this make sense, though? Like, it was a sphere, and then we we concentrated geometry in the corners and the edges. And that means that it's smooth, but it's it's smooth smooths less. So it allows you to sharpen objects while still making them smooth, um, which is just very useful. So like I said, I'm going to press X to delete this object. And we're going to go back to our um, uh, object here. And we're going to add some more edge loops to just sharpen this up. Uh, this will not look exactly like the piece I showed you before, but um, this is sort of starting to take a little more shape, I, I think. Um, so yeah. Uh, now we have an object um, that kind of works. It's got some sort of complicated geometry if you look at it. Uh, we're using some modifiers. Let's get into rendering. Let's follow that timeline that I established in the in the slides. So what we're going to do is, if you have a, a keyboard with a number pad, I encourage you to use it. Because you have this really cool trick where if you press 7 on the number pad, it, it brings you to the top view. And if you press 1, right, 1, it'll bring you to the side view, and 3, and Nine doesn't do anything, apparently. But um, eight, four, two, and six, which sort of make a number pad, uh, allow you to like uh, click to certain predetermined views. Um, and it's just very useful for being precise when you're modeling. Um, and that's why I brought an extra keyboard. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go to the top view, and we're going to uh, say Shift A. Uh, this is the Add Object menu. And we're going to say Camera. And if you say Control Alt 0, it will snap the camera to your view. Uh, and that's very cool, because now we just know the camera is sort of above the object. And that's all we really care about. Uh, and then you, we're going to add the manipulator and 
if you look, by pressing zero, you go into the camera view. Um, as you can see, it's kind of like cropping out the top and the bottom of this. So we're just going to, first I'm going to make it smaller because that's dumb. Uh, changing the size of the camera doesn't matter. Uh, it's just how big the like fake object is. And we're just going to move it up. And then we're going to check our view, kind of close. And we're going to move it up, check our view. Uh, and then we're going to move it over. Also, I'm pressing, uh, I'm, I'm using the uh, uh, scroll wheel to zoom in and out. Keep forgetting to say stuff like that. So now we have our sort of popsicle. Uh, and if we select it, we can press S. And this will just make it smaller on every axis. Uh, so that's useful. And then we're going to move it up. And uh, also, I forgot to, uh, uh, pressing 5. OK, so there's two views in 3D modeling. There's the uh, perspective view, which basically makes objects that are farther away smaller. And 5 makes it uh, orthographic, which means there's no perspective. So an object 20 feet away will look like it's right next to an object that's right in front of you. Um, and this makes modeling very easy, because uh, you can sort of get really close to an object, um, whereas in perspective view, it doesn't want you to get that close. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the top view, and we're going to uh, whoop, okay. spawn a cube, uh, mesh cube. Is this orthographic? This is orthographic cube, yeah. Um, and we're going to make the cube smaller. I'm pressing S, by the way. That just makes things smaller. Um, and we're going to move this down. It's orthographic and perspective. This is just orthographic. Yeah, uh, orthographic, you can just move around. Um, this is the perspective as opposed to orthographic. Orthographic is the Yeah, that's how uh, 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 like Graphics, Maya and stuff do that. Yeah. 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 With perspective, you have a vanishing point. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, is it generally better to work in orthographic mode? It's all about your workflow, honestly. As an artist, uh, someone creating something, uh, it's really all about what you need. Um, so if you need to look at something in perspective, it's very good. I prefer to model most things in orthographic, just because it's a very, it's very controlled, and it, it, I, I tend to do a lot of. Um, uh, I don't do a whole lot of organic things, so a lot of it sort of what my, my what my modeling screen tends to look like is almost like a, an architect looking at his building, because I m like to model a lot of buildings in my free time. So that. Orthographic uh, helps me uh, make it look like I'm constructing a building, uh, as opposed to like modeling something that's more organic, like a leaf or a tree. Um, it's just a lot more fine-tuned control. Um, so now we're going to select face, and we're going to move this in. And this is going to be the stick, just so you know. Um, and we're going to move that out. And then we're going to resize it on the z-axis and the x-axis. The again, the again. You get it. It's all about fine tuning. Um, so that uh, looks crudely like a stick, um, and we're going to use that. Um, you think? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're going to select this face, and we're just going to move it out. More. More. It's a monster. <laughs> well, it, regardless, it it it, it uh, just needs to work uh, for now. Uh, and we only have. It's whatever. We'll go over on the last talk. Uh, you'll be here for like four hours. It's OK. Um, so we're going to subdivide that. And we don't want it to be like a pencil, but we're going to use that cool Control-R beveling trick. Uh, and we're going to use that on this axis as well. So that looks more like a stick, I think. Um, you also got to do it up here, too. Uh, that's where the geometry ends. So you got to make it look kind of uniform. Um, so that's what our stick looks like if we go to the camera view. Uh, this is generally what we're going to have. Uh, now let's get into textures. Let's give this a really crude texture to start with. Uh, oh, So there are two render engines. There's the Blender render, render engine, and there's the Cycles render engine. Uh, they, are both with, they both come with Blender. Uh, use Cycles. That's all I can say. Blender render engine is the old one. It's from the 90s. It's pretty terrible. Uh, Cycles uh, actually simulates light. The Blender render engine doesn't. Um, and simulating light uh, just makes your, your job a lot easier. Um, it just makes everything look really photorealistic out of the box. If you want to make something look non-photorealistic, 
the Blender render engine would be, would be good. But for most projects, Cycles is just good. It takes a little longer to render, unless you have an awesome graphics card. But for today, we are going to use Cycles. Um, and we're going to say use nodes, because we want to use some nodes. And we're just going to make this red to start. Uh, and it's not showing up here, because we are in object view and not um, material view. So we're going to switch to material view, and now it's red. And then we're going to make this. Uh, we're also going to give it a crude texture of like brownish, I guess. Um, and now it shows up because we're in material view instead of object view. And we're going to name them, because you can name materials. So we're going to name this stick. And we're going to right click on this, and we're going to name it popsicle. Oh, that's not nice spell popsicle. I'm a professional. <laughs> popsicle. Um, so we're going to make this one a little darker, just so they're easier to identify. Um, and like I said, middle mouse click to rotate around an object. Uh, and then that's good. Let's render just to see what happens. Um, you press F12 to render. Uh, and this weird thing happens where it kind of looks crappy. Uh, that's because there's no light in the scene. Well, there is. It's global light. But we don't want global light, because that puts the same amount of light on everything, and that's not what we want. So what we're going to do is uh, press Escape to get out of that um, render, render preview view. Um, and we're going to uh, make a plane. This will make sense in a second. Uh, and you can do this really cool thing with cycles where you can make an object uh, and give it emission properties, which means that it emits light, um, which is really cool. So we're just going to call this light. Uh, and we're going to give it the emission. Uh, the surface is just what skin is on the thing. And we're going to say emission. Help me find this, guys. Emission, there we go. Uh, and we're going to give it a, a strength. Well, OK, let's just see what strength one looks like. Uh, not very great. A um, little improvement, I think. But uh, let's bump that up to like 10. Uh, let's actually bump it up to 10, maybe. Yeah, there we go. And let's do that. And now we have a lot more definition, I think. Um, so that's cool. Uh, we're also going to go into our render settings really quick. And we're going to say transparent, because we want a transparent render uh, eventually. And let's render again. And now you can see the checkerboard background. Uh, so that's cool. So press Escape. Um, so we have our light source, we have our object, and our camera. Um, but this object is not the right texture yet. Um, if you look at my example, it had sort of this red, white, and blue texture. And Blender with nodes, you can do this really cool thing where you can make procedurally generated textures. And this means that you hook up nodes in a series of orders uh, and mess with the numbers just right. And people have done things like generating procedurally generating wood textures that look exactly like wood, but there's no images involved. It's just nodes plugged into nodes with the right values. And it looks exactly like a wooden log or, or what have you. So it's a very powerful tool, very impressive, I think. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to generate this texture um, with nodes. So we're going to, um, sorry, I should, can, I should say what I'm doing. So uh, you click this little, there's like a little thing up here, you can see. Uh, my cursor becomes a plus. Uh, that basically means you can pull out a new window, uh, like a tile, a tile basically, like a tile panel. Uh, but we don't want it up there. We want it down here. And we want a new tile panel. But we don't want it to be the 3D view, because that doesn't make sense. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to say we want this to be the node editor. So this is like selection of different views. And it has a series of views, like text editor, um, logic editor for video games, movie clip editor. Um, timeline, like we saw earlier. Uh, but we want the node <coughs> editor, because uh, that's going to be the most useful for us. And we're going to click on the image uh, node. Uh, actually, we want this to be up, I just realized. So that will give you guys a little better view. Node editor. Uh, click on the image, say use nodes. And we don't want that panel. I'm going to zoom in using my scroll wheel. And we have. What we have right here, oh, come on. Uh, we have our output node and our input node. And the input node right now is just the image that we just generated by pressing F12. And it, as you can see, it just changed. And then this is the output node. And we want to change the output. Uh, actually, I'm jumping ahead. Sorry. Materials. We want materials. Um, we're going to select our object. And this is the nodes for our material. Uh, output is the skin that's on the, the popsicle. Input right now is just a single color. Uh, and what we want is we want to generate um, a color ramp. Um, that's what that's what this is. It's a ramp between red and blue, kind of. And you influence what different colors are between. 
uh, and we want to paste that color ramp on, onto the final object. So the way we do that is I have a cheat sheet. Um, it's called color ramp. Cool. Um, yeah, this one. Add. Uh, yes. This one, color ramp. Yeah, hey, color ramp. There you go. Thank you. Uh, and what we're going to do is this is a color and this is a color, so that means that we should plug them together. And um, so that's cool. Uh, this actually doesn't work yet, though, uh, because for some reason it just doesn't. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a gradient texture node. Uh, add, uh, sorry, texture, gradient texture. Hey, thank you. I love doing it in front of an audience because everyone just can just tell me where the buttons are. Um, so for some reason, we have to tell it to be a gradient. And then we can tell it what the gradient is, and then we pump that into, I think that's right. Yeah. Uh, and then just pump that into the final color, and then pump that to the output, which is the skin on the popsicle. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to add, uh, we're going to change this to be uh, uh, blue, let's say. Uh, we're going to change this one to be, come on, click it, A, be red. And then we're going to add, and you can see it gradients between the two. It makes purple in the middle, which is really cool, but we don't want that. So what we're going to do is we're going to click plus, and it automatically generates purple, which is the color right between the two. And we're going to say, just make this white. We just want this one to be white. And that sort of achieves what we want, um, just looking at this, just this. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to click on this. Uh, come on. Why aren't you selecting? Um, hey, OK. And we're going to click plus, And that generates a, uh, an arrow right between the two. And we just want that one to be, um, we want that one to be, what is it, white? No, we want that one to be blue. Yeah. And then we're going to click the red one and do the same. And a lot of this is just me messing with this for like four hours and figuring it out. Um, and then we're going to click the red one, and we're going to say plus, And it generates one right, before, right between the red and the white. And we're going to say, we just want this one to be right white. And this sort of gives you very definitive, like, this is the blue section, this is the white section, this is the red section. And that's pretty much what we did here, was we have like a red section, a white section, a blue section. It doesn't gradient between blue, white, and red. It's very definitive lines. And that's what we want to achieve here. And as you can see, just from the preview, it's white, it's, it's blue, white, and red. And if you look at our thing, it doesn't quite work. Um, there's a little trick uh, I had to figure it out. It took me a while. Uh, you have to you have to add these two nodes, which are basically um, uh, mapping nodes, which basically tells it uh, how do we take the skin and put it onto the object. So, again, this took me years to figure out. Uh, you have the texture coordinate node, and we're just going to say generated texture coordinates, um, and then we're going to say mapping, and we're going to have to do some rotation. Um, but first, we need to add the uh, add input texture coordinates. Generated. Let's just render just to see what that looks like. We're close. We're close. Um, and I can actually just cut this node off uh, and render again and just see what it looks like. Weird. Okay, we're close to. Uh, take that. Take that coordinate off, and it just looks white. So that's why we need that node. Oh, not that. That's what we need. Uh, so we're gonna add this, but it's it's on the wrong axis, right? Like we hook this up to this. It's on the wrong axis. So we need to add a middleman between this node and this node. And when you get into the workflow, you will understand what needs to go where, just based on necessity. And you sort of, ref it's, it's all about refining the product that you have. Um, sorry if we go a little over. We're almost done, I swear. Um, and we're going to add a vector mapping. And we're going to say texture and rotate it on the, uh, let's see. Yeah, I think it's Z. Let's try it out. Uh, F12 to render. And hey, we're pretty close. Um, if we change this to be easing, oh, it doesn't matter. Linear. Um, so these are just different mathematical uh, algorithms, essentially, that do the gradiating for you. Uh, they will produce slightly different things, but they will all gradient. So we can change the radial if you want it, and it produces. You don't want that. Um, linear? linear is what we usually stick with. This, the default is usually fine. Um, so yeah, that's what we're doing right now. Um, uh, but then if you look at the example, this is kind of shiny. It's got sort of that porcelain effect that I was talking about earlier. So what we're going to do is we're going to 
uh, this color can plug into anything. So right now it's plugging into diffuse, but we can add a shader uh, <coughs> glossy and plug that into there, and it can plug into two things at once, and then add shader mix and plug that into there, and then plug this into here. And uh, if you look at it, not quite right, we need to do a little refinement, but a uh, little trick is if you have diffuse, uh, well, first off, you want to turn the roughness off for the glossy, because essentially that's sort of like uh, you have metal or you have like um, poly like, uh, like a steel fridge, uh, like kind of rough. Uh, we're going to uh, change the influence to be like 0.5, I think. No, sorry, 0 0.05. Try that. That looks, whatever, I'll, I'll go with it. Um, let's get into the compositing part where we composite the final image. Um, and that's really cool where this is the exact same trick that I showed earlier where we just add an alpha over node, alpha over, and then we add, whoa, not what we want. Okay. Um, the bottom image is pasted on top. Does that make sense for the alpha over node? And then we're going to add a color, uh, and we're just going to say RGB curve, which is basically, uh, if you mess with these red, green, and blue curves, you basically say, like, I want more blue, I want less blue, et cetera. Uh, but we don't want to mess with that. We're just going to mess with this color, uh, which we're going to make like that. Um, we plug that into the bottom, and that sort of gives us this purpley, uh, it looks kind of, not purpley, uh, like yellowy look. Um, cool. So what, we do, uh, what, we, what we've done is sort of went through what my slide said, which is we made an object, we added the background, um, and now I'm going to add some text really quick. Uh, and Blender does this really cool thing where uh, you can just say Shift A text and go into edit mode for text and just change what it says. So this is not a obstacle. Uh, and then make it smaller. And then go to your camera view to see what it says. And it's not a popsicle. Press render. And that kind of works. Um, so yeah, sorry. I should let you guys go. But um, are there any questions? Huh? Tons? Yeah. Uh, you're welcome to talk to me after this. Uh, I apologize for not making this look more polished. Um, I hope this has been a great introduction for just Blender, knowing what Blender can do. Uh, and yeah, go to these resources to learn more. Uh, it's a really powerful tool. I love it. Um, been using it for seven years, so obviously I like it a little. <laughs> <laughs>